My name is Ben, and I've been working with uh, Create International for quite a while now, for about 19 years, uh, doing what you've been hearing all about, which is producing evangelistic films for the unreached, really trying to find how can we uh, create a presentation that would share uh, with an unreached audience in as culturally specific a way as possible. So that includes using their heart language, you know, like Carol talked about earlier. Uh, but then also uh, different details of their culture, just different aspects of their arts, uh, the way that they communicate, so that the movie will be as appealing as possible. And why do we do this? Because we know, as I was listening to Clyde share during the EMDC, that stories communicate, and they communicate in a way that other types of information don't communicate. Stories communicate to our emotions, they communicate to our hearts. They can even bypass maybe sometimes our intellectual defenses and actually get in there and uh, really speak in a deep place. We do this because we know that stories, when they're shared along um, indigenous communication systems, when they're shared along the way that people are used to receiving information, when the stories include uh, people's own arts or own ways of, of processing, they're more effective at communicating. And we do this because, as we've been learning as well from our time around the map, there are many, many nations that need to hear the gospel. And we all know that. There's many nations that need to hear the gospel. There's many nations that don't have these sorts of stories uh, that have been you know, crafted in their own culture. Psalm 96.3 says something about publishing his glorious deeds in the nations. So there's, it's talking about proclaiming God's word, but it's talking about publishing it. it kind of takes it into another level where it's actually putting it down into a fixed form, into something that can be distributed, something that can be multiplied, something that can be broadcast. And um, that's what we're really about, is publishing God's glorious deeds in the nations. There's going to be a few pictures and so on uh, going as we go along here. I had the opportunity last year to go to Nepal with my team, and actually to go back to Nepal. We went to uh, an area that we had done, a project for a people group called the Limbu, and we were able to go do evangelism and Bible distribution and prayer for people, but also handing out copies of the movie that we had made and inviting people to screenings. And it was really amazing to be able to do that because we got to see a little bit about the other end. I've been making these movies for many years, but I got to see a little bit more about the other end of actually producing these projects. We saw that when we had a film that we could invite people to, that it gave them a focus. It gave them something that made them interested to actually come out of their homes and to gather around at an event. It meant that when the film started and they were walking by or they had come, that they stayed interested. They stayed interested and wanted to see the movie until the end. It meant that um, it gave a platform for the local workers to be able to build upon these, this event to develop future relationship uh, with the people in that area. And it also gave us the amazing testimony of a young guy who said, um, I identify with the character in this film. And he identified with him not just in his struggles, but he identified with him in the way that the gospel had touched him and changed his life. So the gospel had touched the character, and this young guy in a village said this was basically what he saw and what he wanted, and how he, he wanted to be as well. So really encouraging to see that. But then the big question for us is how do we do this? You know, and, and how do we actually find a story that's going to be really effective? And I, this is sort of like a teaching time, but it's also super simple, and I hope it's not disappointing in that respect, but there's only a couple of principles that we're going to share, really, and that's the fact that it is based on seeking the Lord, right? It's based on hearing from God and on asking for help, and that's what it all comes down to, that we can seek God, hear His voice, be led by Him, but also learn how desperately we need help, how desperately we need uh, the partnerships. Films, for many of us, if we're production people, they've begun with maybe a script, maybe a story idea, maybe a vision. Um, but in often with Create International, as you've been hearing, they begin with a relationship. It begins with a relationship between our team and project partners, people who share that common vision to actually see a people group reached or see a nation transformed. And that really is the goal, right? It's not to actually to produce an evangelistic movie. That's not the end goal. If that's the end goal, it's pretty small. The end goal is the transformation of a nation. The end goal is seeing unreached groups become reached. Unevangelized groups become evangelized. You know, unengaged groups become engaged. We're looking to see the change of these statistics. We're looking to see colors moving on these little charts that Calvin has made. We're looking to see things shift, you know, in the global picture. 
And we come around in a relationship with a project partner, sometimes it's a local believer, sometimes it's a mission strategist, and say, how can we do this together? One of the ways of doing it is by creating an appropriate audiovisual resource. But it comes back to that question, what's the right story? And whenever we want to make any kind of movie that is going to communicate to an audience that people are going to be interested in, our goal is always to make something that's both familiar and fresh at the same time. It's familiar because we want people to be able to recognize themselves in it. We want them to be able to identify and to make emotional connections with what they're seeing. So that's the contextualization part of it. That people are seeing something and it's like, yeah, I recognize my life, my world in this movie. But it's fresh. It takes me by surprise. I'm not going to be bored by this because I haven't seen it this exactly before. Fifteen years ago, our team was in Indonesia working with a Muslim people group that amongst them, amongst the issues that they were dealing with was an issue of revenge killing. That was actually something that was like a current issue, was issues of revenge killing. So we wrote a movie that was kind of around this issue. And we had our actors together and they were not Christians. They were Muslim guys who came together, Muslim men and women. They were looking at this uh, story and they were like, oh yeah, we know this story. We know what happens here. Do you know? But then they got to the end of it. And all of a sudden, there's somebody actually sacrificing themselves for somebody that doesn't deserve it. Do you know? And there's the, the possibility and the door open for forgiveness and reconciliation. And they were really surprised. So they were like, we know this story, but we did not expect it to end this way. We did not expect it to go this way. So there was something powerful happening there, where there was a story that they felt like, yes, we identify with this. But the presence, the sudden coming in of the gospel message took them by surprise, and it, was, it made it, the movie engaging and interesting for them. So what sort of questions do we ask when we go about these projects? Lots of different types of questions, and I, I don't have answers for these because they're going to be different in every single situation. What does normal life look like? You know, when you're talking to people, what, is, what does regular life actually look like for these people? We go in very quickly. We do research. But we don't spend months or years usually living amongst the people. So we're so dependent on these cultural advisors like Carol was talking about to actually bring us this sort of information. What are their hopes and aspirations? What are their dreams? What are their fears or struggles or sins? How can we show that the gospel is relevant to their lives? One of my favorite questions is to find out, well, when people become Christians, how do their lives actually change? What really changes in their lives when they become believers? Um, what are the ways of sharing the gospel that have been effective and have been used in that, in that area, that have been used well? How do we talk about God? What term do we use for God? What's the right term to communicate that this isn't uh, like a Christian movie, but it's a movie speaking to our Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu audience that will help them to understand who God is? How do we talk about conversion? Somebody actually leaving a different faith system to follow Jesus. You know, for a lot of places, as you guys would know, many of us would know, to say, well, to become a Christian doesn't just mean I became obedient to the commands of Christ. It means I entered into a completely foreign social and economic subset of my society. And it's not necessarily, it's actually something that will then hinder somebody becoming obedient to the commands of Christ rather than encouraging them to do that. So how should we talk about those things? Often we'll say that, well, instead of saying becoming a Christian, we'll talk about they became obedient to Jesus, or they became a follower of Jesus. Or in a Muslim culture, they became a follower of Isa al-Masih. Or in a Hindu culture in India, maybe they became a follower of Sadhguru Yeshu. Different terms that have been used that help people to understand the real meaning of what's going on here. Sometimes we don't have a conversion at all, because that actually will bring up too many, too many complications to to invite somebody into um, a relationship with Jesus. So instead, maybe the film will be about someone becoming very interested in Jesus and wanting to learn more about him. You know, wow, that's uh, this Jesus that you speak of. It's so powerful. I want to know more. Maybe the movie ends there because that's what's appropriate in that particular situation. But these are all dynamics that have to be worked out in every single individual situation to figure out, well, what is actually the most effective? What does prayer look like? It's just talking to Steve about this, you know? How do people pray? Should they pray like this? Like this? Like this? Like this? Do you know what's the way that prayer should be uh, demonstrated? What does a changed life look like, like I said before? 
Ultimately, what sort of story will fit the culture, but also, and communicate the gospel effectively to the culture, but also meet the needs, or be a film that people who are the Christians in that area feel like they can actually use? Ultimately, our goal, yes, is to make a movie for our, our unreached audience, but that movie has to be a film that the local workers, the Christians, the missionaries feel like actually this is something that meets our ministry needs. So that, again, that partnership, that relationship is so critical. That Limbu movie that my team got to go and distribute a couple, last year, we made it a couple of years earlier. We worked with a YWAM Youth with a Mission and Crates part of Youth with a Mission. We worked with a Youth with a Mission worker in that area, a local man who was also an actor, so it was like a match made in heaven in many ways. And uh, he had developed a story that we refined into a script, and it was quite interesting. It dealt with issues of caste-based injustice. It dealt with the fact that uh, many people, including amongst the Limbu, would look down upon the lower castes and treat them you know, unfairly or treat them unkindly. And it was a great story. We really were interested in dealing with that issue. But it was missing one thing that I brought up, and he agreed with me when I brought it up. And that was in his story that he originally developed, the Christian characters were all from the lower caste, all from the people that were being kind of downtrodden. And I said, that's, that's good, but wouldn't it make sense also to have a limbu person who is like sort of similar to the main character, but also be a follower of Jesus? You know, so in order to try to minimize this idea that Christianity is foreign or that the gospel is really for a different group of people other than myself, and he agreed with that. And so it became, that was part of this partnership where there's a story that the worker wants, but there's input that we have as well as media producers to develop something that's going to be even more powerful and more effective. But this need for cultural help, it doesn't only happen during the scripting stage, right? It's not only in this script development place because we need this assistance and this input all the way through. I'm working often in, a, in, a, in a, an environment that's very foreign to me. I can barely buy a loaf of bread, right, in the place that I've gone to outreach. I can barely, like, do the simplest thing. How am I going to find actors? How am I going to find props? How am I going to find locations to actually work with? And so there's this need for that cultural help that happens moment to moment, guidance all the way through the filmmaking process. And again, that comes out of the, the blessing of these relationships with partners that we develop. But we also have a few practical ways that we go about it, things that we do. We always, we learn something, I guess, I learned from Calvin and Carol, and I gather that they learned from the guys at Global Recordings many years ago, which is basically that we number all of our scenes and dialogue all the way through our film. So you'll have your English script with whatever, 200, 300, 100 lines of dialogue, and then you'll have your local language script that has all the exact same numbers uh, written against all the same lines. So that when you're shooting, you just always know where you are with each other. You know, you make the announcement, okay, we're gonna shoot, you cue it on your, on your film, we're, we're shooting lines 42 to 46, you know, take one. And um, everybody knows where you are, and then most importantly, when you come back for your editing, you know where you are, you know, and you've kept records about how that went, kept a log as you go along, so that later on you're like, well, was that a good take? I can't tell by listening to it, maybe, but I've got my log information that helps me to remember. There's lots of translation and back translation. Lots of times when you're right there in the field and they do the line, of course, I need the advisor's help even to tell me, uh, did he say that line properly? And what did you think of their performance? And actually, what did they say? Because I think it was a little bit long compared to what's written in the script. Oh, yeah, yeah, we changed a few things. Okay, that's fine. What did you change? Let me know. And we have a bit of a discussion there. And you find out that, you know, maybe the meaning of the line is, is perfectly fine. It's just that some of the words were changed. And that's what you're wanting. You're wanting these guys to come on and put on an authentic stamp of approval on it. Sometimes in the script writing stage, I remember working with my friend Jason. And the two of us kind of butting heads over really fine details about dialogue. And then we thought, this is ridiculous. We're wasting our time here because after this, it's all going to get translated into another language anyway. And there are little fine tunes about whether he said what or he said, oh no, what? Actually, it's not going to make any difference, you know, um, because of the translation. We need to learn to ask what I feel like are the weirdest questions. Things that just, I never, it just never occurred to me that I'd ever have to ask this. You know, uh, simple things like what does a meal look like? What do greetings look like? 
What, does, what kind of a place would young people pull over their car and sit down to have a picnic by the side of the road? And we had a whole day we spent trying to find the exact type of place that fit both the needs of the filming and made sense for the culture. The first place that I picked, this was in Thailand, in this country, the first place that I picked, I thought this is great, it fits the film perfectly. And the advisors were all like, this looks like a haunted forest. This looks like a place that would be full of ghosts. We would never, ever stop here. Like, okay. And then we went to another place, and they're like, we would stop here. And in this place, it was like, I don't know how to describe it. It was, it was ugly, it was barren, and the sun was lying on top of our heads as if the sun weighed 20 tons. And we were like, can we go someplace a little bit? And then eventually we found the place that worked for everybody. But maybe one of the funniest questions, just this learning to ask, hey, what does it look like when a son disrespects his father in this culture? You know, we often do like prodigal son inspired things. So there's a lot of sons disrespecting their fathers. And in my mind, that looks a certain way. And it turns out this is culturally determined. It turns out that my thought about what it looks like when a son slams the door and storms out and yells at his dad and, you know, is not appropriate. They're like, no, a son would never disrespect his father that way. But he's disrespecting him, so isn't it? He's like, no, it would, he would still kind of bow down and touch his feet and, you know, greet him or whatever that appropriate response is. So unusual questions. And then, you know, I'm an American and I'm a filmmaker and I'm busy and I'm under stress because we're doing this in a short amount of time. And I'm like, I'm in a hurry. You know what I mean? I need to get through this stuff. And so it can, and I'm working in a culture where people don't feel comfortable saying no to somebody who's acting like that, right? Generally speaking, where they feel like, well, I don't want to confront you. I'm just going to say whatever you want to hear to make you happy, you know? But of course, ultimately what I want is not just for people to make me happy. I want to hear the truth. But I've had to learn to really adjust and modify my behavior in that. And I remember... I don't, I don't remember where this was, maybe Myanmar, but I remember setting up something, setting up a shot, whatever was going on, and saying to my advisor, okay, we set this up. Is this good? And he was like, yeah, yeah, it's good. And I was like, great. Then, okay, wait. Would you ever do it like this? No. Can you imagine ever doing it like this? No. Do you think we should change it? Probably yes, you know. <laughs> So just learning to deal with my own, my own stress, learning how to handle things and handle all the uncertainties that are part of this process with grace, with patience, and ultimately with faith. Okay, I'm gonna play just a little, little video that just shows some behind the scenes stuff. Things are going to happen. 
things are going to happen that you just don't expect. You know, and that's why actually doing like a proper teaching about this is very difficult because we could list every single obstacle that any of us in this room, Create International or other ministries, have faced on the field and have a giant encyclopedia of it. And yet when you went out into the next project, you would find like 10 things that you just didn't think of, that you didn't write down. So whether that's like weird sound issues, like the pig that was squealing up the valley on the long road uh, to where we were filming, or actors suddenly losing their temper and getting angry and quitting in the middle of shooting a scene, electricity cutting in and out, or local police or other security or officials coming along and wanting to know just exactly what was going on in an environment where we didn't want them to know exactly what was going on. <laughs> Things come along and you don't expect them. And you know, these projects are really fun and they're also really not fun at the same time. It was not fun when I was in Nepal filming and the camera slipped off the grip and fell on the ground and broke the housing. Do you know what I mean? Nobody was having fun at that moment. Nobody was like, oh, this is so great being here on the field doing these projects. But yet the camera still worked and we all did have a lot of fun later on in that shoot when we were up the steep hill and it started raining and we thought, you know what, no one wants to walk down and up this steep hill again. We're just going to keep going. And so we filmed all afternoon getting wetter and wetter and keeping an umbrella over the camera, uh, getting this big fight scene that we were working on done. That was kind of fun. We all agreed later on. Um, and yet God shows breakthrough and protection and strength all the time. You know, whether it's protection related to local authorities and divine wisdom that he drops into Carol's mind about how, no, we should be filming inside today rather than outside because of those sorts of challenges. Or solutions for other delays, really random things, like the time that my team was quarantined in our housing in, in India because they thought that SARS had broken into Hyderabad. Or the time, you know, where re re relationships are reconciled when they are broken before. Or weird difficulties with actors. You get, I showed you Final Night before, that five minute trailer, or that two minute trailer when I shared earlier. We had a situation there where that, that, that shoot went brilliant. It went so smoothly until the day after the last day, when we were actually finished, and we suddenly found out that one of our actors we had to remove from the film completely. We weren't allowed to actually edit him into the movie, and so very quickly, we had to scramble around, find another guy, shoot a bunch of close-ups of his face, and then figure out that we could edit those into the movie itself. Do you know? So it's like, all right, I was having fun up until this moment. Now I'm a little bit stressed out. But yet God still makes a way. Because, you know, there's an enemy that doesn't want these projects done, right? He wants to delay it. He wants to slow it down. He wants to hinder it. He wants to stop it. But there's God who actually wants them done. You know? And he's, he's, we're on his side. We're joining into what he's doing. And he's making a way forward for us. We've seen miraculous provision of actors. Actors who started off as drivers and ended up as Christians, you know, and became actors in between. We've had miraculous provision of, of props. I've heard Create Thailand has another story that's kind of like this, but 20 years ago almost, or 18 years ago, we had a prop that turned out to be waiting for decades, a painting that was waiting in an office, seemingly just for us to show, show up and to use it, a, a perfectly a perfectly suited for our movie contextual painting of a particular Bible story in a particular unreached country, sitting in an office that had been made who knows when. And then we came along and said, well, this is the exact thing that we dreamt about, that we never expected. I didn't even know to pray for it. How do I pray for something like that, that there'd be this beautiful, massive painting contextually made for this particular Bible story? And yet God made a way. And so much of it you know, we experiencing it as we enter into prayer and worship. You know, there have been lots of projects that have just been challenging, slow going, difficult, challenging in terms of the team unity, challenging in terms of working with the actors. But when the team comes together with a new level of desperation and prayer and in worship, a new level of commitment, we see the breakthrough take place um, many times over and over again. So the, the principles that I share are super simple but there's a lot to unpack in them. Seek the Lord. How are we going to do this? Well, we're going to have to seek God. Remember that actually this is his vision. But he will show us how to do that. And then ask for help. And he's given us this amazing gift of partnership with local advisors, other workers, the people in this room, that we could actually go and see these projects complete, that we could actually go and see effective tools made that could be used to share the gospel with unreached people groups and see the Great Commission fulfilled.
Thank you very much.